Good day, everyone. I am Rajulla, the program executive of Global Ethics Net India, which is an international forum committed to ethics in higher education. Thank you for joining for the second day of the international webinar on the theme "International Student Mobility and Its Implications on Ethics." As said yesterday, this webinar is a joint effort of Scott Christian College. Nagar Koyal, that is located at the southern tip of India, Global Ethics Net India, based in Bangalore, yeah. and Journal of Dharma, based in Bangalore again. We are excited to host the second day of the international webinar. We have two talks today by Dr. Robiora Ike, the Executive Director of Global Ethics Net, Geneva, Switzerland, and Ms. Christine Housel. Donor Relations and Strategic Partnership, Global Ethics Net, Geneva, Switzerland. After that, we have six paper presentations by research scholars from across the globe. We will then close the program with a valedictory speech by the eminent scholar, researcher, and administrator, Dr. J. W. Alexander J. Sudhasan, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Hindustan Institute of Science and Technology, deemed to be university. With this humble words, let me welcome Dr. Dinakar Lal to take over the webinar floor. Sir, please unmute yourself. So good afternoon, dear friends, and a warm welcome to the international webinar on international student mobility and its implications on ethics. I appreciate your participation in the webinar and wish, wish you an enriching experience. Now over to Dr. Sidney Shirley, the coordinator of the webinar. Good afternoon. This international webinar is bringing together people from academic circles, faculty, academic administrators, curriculum designers, research scholars, and education policy makers from across the globe. I'm happy to inform you that we received more than 550 registrations from 45 countries. May I request Dr. Susan Roy, the co-moderator of the webinar to be the moderator of the session. Thank you, Shirley. Respected participants, it's with great excitement that I introduce and welcome Reverend Monsignor Professor Dr. Obiora Ike, who will address us on international student mobility for promoting global peace and understanding. Dr. Ike, born in Northern Nigeria, is a Catholic priest, scholar, publisher, and author. He's an acknowledged and much sought after public speaker and bridge builder across religions, cultures, and continents and is a human rights activist and development practitioner. Dr. Ike has held several positions of service in church, society, and state within Africa and in Europe. Currently, he's the executive director of GlobeEthics.net in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm sure all of you will be motivated by his talk. With these simple words, I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Ike and hand over the webinar flow to him. Over to you, sir. Thank you for all the introductions. And I'm very glad, really delighted to be invited to participate at this very auspicious conference and webinar on international student mobility and its implication on ethics. This morning here in Geneva, where we are, it's morning. Uh, but today um, I am being asked to focus on one area of this discussion, which deals with the factors of international global peace building and understanding which students can make possible. Indeed, in appreciating the organizers of this conference, I would like to extend my warm regards to our program executive in India, Ms. Rajula in globeethics.net India, but I will also want to extend my thanks 
to the Department of English of the Scott University, Scott Christian College in Tamil Nadu, and the Journal of Dharma in Bangalore. I listened yesterday very carefully into the discussions, and I was delighted at the galaxy of people you'd invited from across the globe to contribute ideas on how something that is so key in our world, students, have often not been put on the spotlight because it is a key point. Internationalization of higher education institutions is not an option. It is, what may say, it is the way to go. And when we look at migrations globally, people or mobility globally, often we talk about mobility of workers. We think about 65 million refugees worldwide. But you know what? We have over 250 million students moving across borders every year. This is a very, very large number. And students' mobility um, globally can contribute to global peace. And that is the topic I'm asked to address. But first of all, a few words about globeethics.net. This is a global network on applied ethics with individuals and institutional participations. Globe Ethics in the last years has grown to become the leading ethics institution that tries to integrate ethics, especially in higher education. Um, Globe Ethics looks first of all into even the term ethics, which it tries to look into as um, a concept that helps human beings think rightly, act rightly, use their freedom properly, develop a moral reasoning as a compass for action. And therefore, we focus on institutions of higher education, on teachers who teach in higher education institutions, on professionals who come out of educational institutions, and of course, the students who are the largest component. And what we say is, people who go to universities must come out not only with knowledge, they must also graduate with some character, with a learning that has um, a rational, ethical orientation. So we provide resources around ethics. Actually, Globe Ethics has large resources through its library, through its publications, and on its academy and online services. And then we build a network around the world. Globe Ethics is like in India with an office, in Indonesia, in China, in Latin, in Latin America, in Argentina, in African nations, African countries, in Europe itself, where Geneva is the headquarters. So, and it is growing into becoming the leading ethics institution in the world. Now, ethics also deals with peace. And this brings me now to the topic I'm being asked to address. Cross-border, students moving from one country to another to acquire knowledge, to acquire experience is a phenomenon that is so ancient. People went to read in ancient Egypt. They left various countries. In those days, we didn't talk about countries. We talked about nations to go to Egypt. They left there to go to Greece. Later on, it became Rome. At a certain time, it became Paris. And this where when you have a teacher and you have a library, it pulls people together. So the teacher and the library became the resource where people searching for knowledge anywhere in the world went to acquire it. In our modern times, in the 21st century, universities are everywhere. And the colonial experience limited the languages many people speak to English, French, Hindi, um, uh, Hausa, Fulani, Swahili, um, German, and people now move into those countries to acquire a second knowledge. They are mainly students. So when student mobility happens, a few things follow. One is cultural, intercultural communication. By moving from one country to another, you gain the experience and the knowledge of the culture of the other. You exchange. The second, which is very important, is financial and business and market orientation. Students move money because you pay school fees. 
you pay accommodation fees, you pay for other fees, and you buy books, you buy, go to markets in the country where you study. So student mobility increases the potential for financial flows within the countries. A country like Britain would collapse educationally if it stopped having higher education students or even undergraduate students coming to study in their countries. The same thing will happen with many other countries. So that pooling students to come and study, acquire knowledge is even a foreign policy of many governments. We also look at this dimension when you talk about peace, the best ambassadors for peace are people who have crossed a border, who have known the language of the other, who have become members of another community and who are now living in countries. They may not be appointed, um, uh, appointed ambassadors, but they are really ambassadors of their countries. Think about Indian students studying in the United States. Think about African students studying in India, and many have done that. I have sent also my students to study in India, and they came back not only to teach us Hindi, but to teach us about yoga and some Indian cultures. Think about those who have left Europe to go and study in African nations, or the people who go to China to study. And this entire environment of students mixing with one another is an ambassadorial job that really helps for peace and security globally. Because when I know you, when I know your culture, when I know your language, when I can interact with you, when I've seen your face, we become friends. Student mobility also adds to exposure. Some people travel because they need to travel, but many students who travel live in the countries of study for some years. So they are not just tourists. They are, you might say, residents in the countries for the period where they are. Look at the global space. Any leader of a country who had a student mobility background, who studied in another university outside one's borders, build global peace. And when you find some global leaders who always lived in their country, studied in the same village, eventually emerged as becoming politicians, they think too local. Permit me now to talk about promoting global peace and understanding through students' mobility. We all know that peace is primary in the world. Without peace, there can be no development. Without peace, there can be no stability. Without peace, there can be nothing of all the things we think about. Peace is an ideal and peace is worth it. And your conference has asked us how do we bring in peace into the agenda of student mobility as an item which ethics can ingredient? In other words, if peace is primary, we know each other better, we respect each other better, and then we do not start throwing stones. We do not start fighting immediately. If I am the foreign minister of a country like India, and another is the foreign minister of a country like the United States, and we had studied in each other's countries, and there was going to be confusion. We would even speak in the languages of the other and calm the temperature. We know that peace is necessary, but peace is not possible without justice. And what makes justice is to give each person one's due. Many things that happen on the areas of injustice are called bias, prejudices. Such prejudices could be cultural prejudices, racial prejudices, religious prejudices, class prejudices. And when there are prejudices, prejudice means judging before. You have not known the person, but you've judged the person already. Student mobility help us to remove all the prejudices we have about the other. If I would, and I use myself as an example, I come from Nigeria. My first international country of study was Austria. And when I came to Austria, which is in the heart of Europe and eventually continued both to Germany and the United Kingdom and to France all to study, 
I found out that what we thought about these countries and about these persons were on the levels of bias. And as I interacted more with my friends from all these countries, I saw human beings. So students' mobility minimizes cultural bias. And it improves intercultural friendships. We must think about global peace as not something that happens just in offices of the United Nations or in offices of administrators or by people writing theses in universities. Global peace is achieved through handshakes, handshakes over the Atlantic, over the Pacific, over the Indian Ocean, over the Trans-Saharan deserts, handshakes whereby you embrace the other and you embrace the other by having known and seen the other face. So talking about global peace as, a, as in the dimension of students' mobility, it is important for leaders of nations to see students as ambassadors for peace. And their teachers eventually, as the, we may say, the planters of this seed that grows global peace. There are so many wars in the world, many of them unnecessary. People are dying for reasons we do not know. Student mobility, and like we said, they have a large number. Students' mobility is not only encouraged, it is a sine qua non. That is, it, is, it has to be done because by acquiring knowledge, whether it's in technology or in medicine or in culture or in religion or in other studies, we build up not only our potential, we give back. Knowledge is not private. Student mobility make knowledge serve peace. The more I know, the more I am humble. And when I am humble, I'm able to engage. I would like to end my reflection, therefore, by talking about a few things which I think should encourage, let me say, the countries where students go to be receptive. And one of it is, how do we assure the well-being of those who have entered our countries? They have to struggle for migration, for paper, for visa. And you see sometimes officials of government behaving as if the students were a burden. The students are coming to bring money. They're coming to bring knowledge. They're coming to bring culture. They're coming to bring wisdom. They're coming to share also. So making visa restrictions so heavy impedes students' mobility. There is a difference between someone going to study and someone going for holidays and someone going just to, depart, to, to be a refugee and asylum and so on. On the level of students' mobility, an appeal is being made to teachers, all to uh, practitioners around the world, especially those who are in policy making to lighten the burden. COVID entered our world. COVID did not ask for visa. It did not ask for passport. It just moved internationally and just caused trouble and disruptions for everybody. And here you have students and COVID is negative, is a, Ill, is a public health challenge. But here you have students who are bringing something good and are asking for visas to go to one country to another and they are being impeded. The, by making it difficult and more difficult, you reduce the promotion of global peace and understanding. The other one is inclusion. Inclusion is a necessary good, is a tool that is used universally. In other words, the more we are open to a globe that includes others, that respects others, that agrees to tolerance, the, and these are ethical values. The more we create a platform for a universal human family where the students come, learn, study, acquire it, transfer it back to their countries or to their new places of chosen residence in a global environment where people have freedom to live where they would want to and to pay taxes and to obey the rules. The world has moved on. We cannot wind back the clock. The other one is gender respect. It is clear that peace can be built when we respect each other, when we find each other in fairness 
and in openness and in transparency. There has been a lot of gender debate and gender oppression, whether it's of men, of women, of others, and promoting global peace and understanding, even in the area of student mobility, looks also on the shadow of gender. How do we treat these young boys or young girls or young students or young researchers who come to our countries? Do we exploit them or do we give them a platform to be, let me say, in integrated in their new communities? So it is a welcoming challenge. When I talk about well being, when I talk about absence of prejudices, because these are the justice questions within peace. If peace is possible only when there is justice, these issues then assume the justice equation, which questions the environment for students to study. I do feel that student mobility is a dimension of ethics. And as we know, with COVID disruptions, many students are at home. Now, some are doing online studies, universities are closed, universities are challenged, students are challenged, their teachers are challenged. Um, it is necessary to go back to the ethics equation. Ethics is about life. And at globeethics.net, we, we defined ethics with just few words, and it applies to what I'm talking about, promoting um, global peace and understanding, and also about engaging ethics in education. We said that ethics is made up of six acronyms, E, T, H, I, C, S. That is the spelling. But E stands actually for empowerment. When you empower people, whether it's by knowledge or by character or by virtue or by finances, they stand above all with ethics. The second is T, and that is transformation. Global peace is possible when there is the transformation of the human person. There is no war out there in the world. There is only war within human beings. Transformed human beings do not cause war, they bring peace. And when they imbibe ethical values. The third is H. H is the holistic approach. The holistic approach makes you to integrate, to bring into the fore every other, nature, nurture, environment, space, ecology, all in one, and to give them their due respect. The next is I. I stands for integrity. Can you use lies to build a civilization? Can you make, can you be a good teacher when you lack integrity? Can you stand as a nation, a governor or whatever, when your ability for, let me say, um, uh, um, uh, being an honest, respected person is under question. So high reputation is important. And this is what globeethics.net tries to put across, that integrity is part of the show. There are two more, C and S. C stands for competence. Competence. Competence means well-trained, well-resourced, well-researched, able, and competence is square peg in a square hole. Students' mobility help them to discover their talents. And then they are given the competence or they acquire the competence. You might talk about the talents they have. And the last links us with the United Nations. It is sustainability. Ethics serves a sustainable world, a sustainable environment, a sustainable humanity, a sustainable person. And when there is sustainability, what are we talking about? The linkage of the past, of the present, and of the future. And the linkage of the past and the present and the future is one. It is not a, let me say, a dichotomy of over the wall and beyond the wall. Sustainability is linking the past to the present, knowing that I cannot exploit the resources of the future in the present and leave nothing for the future. And knowing that who I am today and what I have today, I have inherited from the past. So ethics is the ingredient that helps students who are on mobility, studying in institutions of higher learning and becoming professionals, even their teachers, to gain global peace and understanding. 
your conference and your webinar topic is well placed because it fits into globeethics.net agenda. And I would like to really once again congratulate all of you, the organizers of this conference and this webinar. You are great people. You have fought into the content and into the context. The world right now needs to place students' mobility as an agenda for action. And ethics is the tool, the vehicle to make it happen. Because without ethics, there could not be a sustainable environment and a sustainable world. Dr. Dinkalai, I would like to thank you with Dr. Susan and Dr. Sidney who really welcomed me and Rajula once again, all the best. I have not seen my friend, Father Jose, but I hope he's somewhere around. He is a great man who works very well with um, globeethics.net. And we are proud of our globeethics.net office in India. The things you are doing, constantly active. And when you look at this young lady called Rajula, you say, what? She has plenty of energy, of innovation, of ideas. And it makes me happy that this today, um, the 4th of December, when you bring this conference to a close, people around the world, I mean, I saw Father Peter Egelewa, who teaches in Nigeria, joining. I listened to someone from Kenya make a speech yesterday. I saw someone from Latin America who made a very powerful presentation. You are uniting the world, even on a Zoom level, but I embrace you all, and we work for global peace and understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you. We embrace you, you Robiora. Thank you, Reverend Father, for the wonderful and motivating talk. Having you has been a feather in our cap. I once again thank you. And let us move on to the next speaker of the day, Ms. Christine Housel. May I request Dr. Evangeline Jemmy to be the moderator of the session. Good afternoon, friends. It's a great pleasure to introduce Ms. Christine Housel, who is currently the Director for Strategic Partnerships and Donor Relations of Globetics Net Geneva, Switzerland. Ms. Housel is an experienced educator and executor and is passionate about building partnerships and creating more loving ethical communities. Ms. Housel's expertise lies in strategic partner relationships in education and NGO management. She is committed to discovering the richness that intercultural, intergenerational, ecumenical, and interfaith relationships bring. She is a strong supporter of Globethics Net from its inception and joined the team in October 2019 to lead the work in donor relations and strategic partnerships. I now call upon Ms. Christine Housel to put across her views on new methodology and curriculum, ethical issues encountered by international students. I also request Ms. Housel to speak about Globethics Net Geneva, the online academy, e-library, and the different courses offered for professors and research scholars. Over to you, Ms. Kristen. Thank you so much, Dr. Jemmy, and to all the organizers. It is a pleasure to be with you today. We, we together are right now experiencing and co-creating and through doing so, building our skills in some of the new methodologies we have been thrown into due to COVID-19. We are working together to make the best out of the situation and not only that, but to discover the until now little explored possibilities before us. We are also through doing so doing the work of educators and students and researchers, which is to put ourselves to the task of understanding and analyzing the benefits, the losses, the risks, the implications, the possibilities, etc., and proposing new ways forward. So my topic 
for today is around new methodologies and curriculum and specifically related ethical principles that we would like to highlight and hold up. I will share some thoughts in conversation with yesterday's speakers and from my own experience. And I will use a part of my time telling you about globeethics.net and the methodologies we are using and exploring as we work to embed ethics in higher education. Let me ground some of my comments in my own experience of international mobility as a student and young teacher. When I was 14, my parents decided to take an assignment with my dad's company in Germany from the United States. Because we found out only a month or two before we were to move and we had not had any German, my parents put us in school in English for better or worse on a US military base. Though it was a US context abroad, I remained an outsider. The double displacement was a challenge for a 14 and 15 year old. The two year experience was a huge gift for the cross cultural experience and exposure. And I had some very good college level teachers there who helped me develop intellectual curiosity. My knowledge and horizons forever changed by living in another country. Yet, there was not much chance to integrate in either community. The US military culture was completely foreign to me and it excluded. My dad's company paid for us to attend school there, but we had to leave the base after school activities and could not socialize with other kids, which is so important at that age. Most of them lived and socialized there on the base. At the same time, although I did a few activities with German youth like ballroom dancing, I was also not in their world. For all its struggle and loss, I later came to see this experience of being in a liminal place as a benefit too, because it gave me more sensitivity and awareness of people who are marginalized by systems. This period lay foundations for my vocational commitments to hearing voices that are underheard and community building, inter and cross-cultural work and reconciliation work. I also lived in China for two years right after my own university graduation. I taught English language, writing and literature to English majors at a university. I made an intentional choice to go to a part of the world that I knew very little about and open up my understanding. Those two years felt at the time like a whole lifetime of learning. For the purposes of our discussion here, as a teacher, it opened my eyes to the way in which culture influences teaching pedagogy and methodology and how cross-cultural experiences can be mutually beneficial to the learners, including the teachers. For example, the students were not used to open conversation in class and sharing and debating ideas, which was a methodology that I was familiar with. As a foreign teacher, I was invited to bring in some different methodologies to the classroom, but for them to be effective, I needed to learn more about the pedagogy they were accustomed to mm -hmm. and understand how to introduce something new with sensitivity. I gained a whole new respect for their methodologies. For example, the vast amount of material they could learn through study and memorization. 
I became sensitive also to the risk it implied if they were to volunteer and share their ideas and the way they could be perceived by others negatively if they were too eager to volunteer much information, it could be regarded as promoting oneself or arrogant. I continued to bring the element of discussion into the learning process, but also altered my methodology for it to work in that context and usually called on students to speak instead of asking them to volunteer, made sure to call on everybody. And I didn't push them beyond what they were comfortable. As a teacher, I integrated some of what I learned there into my own methodology and can now more easily adapt my approach according to the group in front of me while still remaining consistent to my values and ethics and even personality and methodo methodological principles in the process. I appreciated the framework we heard from Dr. Clint Lebrun set out for us yesterday. He proposed four lenses through which to engage this transitional moment that we are in as educators and learners. A review is here. One key methodological approach proposed here is to no longer work in silos and alternatively to be active and proactive about working together and creating synergies. I could not agree with Professor Clint and this idea lies behind my work and Globethics.net's vision of building partnerships for changed educational experience and thus changed people and communities. Dr. Clint asked us to be on the lookout for these lenses at work as we listened to the speakers and presenters here in this webinar. Who is using what lens? I have been doing it and it is fun and interesting. Some of us have focused on one, some another. Some have intertwined several within their own talk and we see within their own work. It makes my learning more intentional. And I am all the more aware that I need the other, the other who takes a different approach and has a different expertise and a different experience. In fact, the need to work in a cross-disciplinary and I would dare say more communal way is not new and has been emphasized as a growing need in today's world by many. This is an overarching point, which was reflected too in Dr. Christoph Stuckelberger's talk yesterday. I like the way that he extended the notion of mobility, where crossing borders of national lines and culture is a unique and invaluable experience of learning and opens us up to new cultures, including educational pedagogical approaches. There are many other ways in which we may experience mobility and exposure, and perhaps must if we are to become responsible leaders for today's world with the character that Professor Obiara was just talking about. We can open ourselves to other disciplines to inform our own and scholars from other cultures to expose, enrich, and sometimes challenge our own. With the world becoming smaller due to technology, we have recognized that it is becoming less a luxury and more a necessity to expose ourselves to others. This COVID-19 period has thrown administrators, teachers, and students into what is a new medium and method for many, online and remote learning. 
again, online learning was already coming in as a supplement to in-person or in some cases, even an alternative for some people. But COVID-19 has effectively thrown us in the deep end and forced many of us to employ this methodology if we are gonna continue the work. We can note that some institutions have paused their work to wait out the storm. This may be at their own peril as most agree that going forward, we will in some way integrate these new skills and methodologies into our normal institutional life. And just how we do it is our common work of creativity and discernment. Globe Ethics Net organized two regional events re recently as a part of something called the President's Forum for an organization called the International Council for Open and Distance Education. And the theme this year was recalibrating educational leadership for resilient education. One speaker reminded us that teachers need technology, pedagogy or methodology and content. Again, this has always been true. The difference now is that there is a serious need for upskilling in the technology and upskilling as well as new creation of pedagogy for the online platform. Many teachers did not sign up for this. They didn't plan on it and feel like mastering the content and the original pedagogies of their discipline and of teaching in person was already filling their busy lives. As one speaker said yesterday, it takes ethical commitment and resolve for teachers to put in the work to continue this learning themselves and support their students as well in the process. One vice chancellor from the same online event on resilient leadership talked about his need to change his methodology also as an administrator and leader of his institution. Recognizing it is a joint learning process where no one has all the answers or all the skills. There is a need for him as a leader to come alongside his staff and journey with them with enormous empathy and compassion. Be transparent and find solutions together. How often do we talk about empathy and compassion when talking about pedagogy and methodology? All the participants of this webinar and in others that I have been attending are asking many questions about methodology. What's working for you? What do we do? How do we do it? Beginning with concern and care is a good place to begin as some teachers and inevitably students are motivated to only do the minimum. But the environment requires more of us today. Where the leadership of administrators is still needed and the expertise and leadership of teachers is still needed, there is a changing relationship between administrators, teachers, and students in the educational process. Even before COVID-19, the rapid rate of technological development has shown us that the older model of teachers developing mastery of a subject and imparting it to students is passing us by where a good teacher is always a learner. There is a shift underway to the teacher serving more as a guide in the learning process. This requires different methodology, which includes a certain vulnerability that it is okay 
not always to be the expert and to be in the learning process together with the students, of course, from a different position. And to recognize that reverse mentoring is sometimes called for and a benefit. If administrators and teachers can model this kind of vulnerability, it will help students learn to learn and to think and to lead in a way that builds up the kind of leadership needed today. Globeethics.net was founded 15 years ago with the idea of creating online tools and spaces for learning, specifically in the area of ethics, as Dr. Ike was telling us. Online in combination with in-person ones. We at Globe Ethics, like others, have been limited in the in-person learning for the moment and propelled forward even further in the development and implementation of online spaces like this one. Our founder, Christoph, who spoke yesterday, his founding conviction was that in our world of fast change, the need for responsible ethical leaders is all the more urgent and that we need to make full use of the relatively still new although quickly evolving online tools as a resource and a platform. One benefit of such a platform as we are seeing today is that it can be a gathering place for all the world where we can work together to find ethical norms that we think we can agree on, find ways to meaningfully implement and contextualize these norms in our educational environments and have respectful dialogue uh, about where our ethical approaches may vary. As Father Joe said yesterday, where we may sometimes differ, the majority of humanity agrees that we should seek an ethical life that looks for the well being of all, recognizing that persons have value and prioritizing the most vulnerable. Thus, the cultural discussions of how to apply and understand this bring us forward. And this includes discussions on methodology and pedagogy. We see this illustrated in this very conference. The vision for this international conference came from the on the ground partnerships in India in dialogue with globeethics.net as a global network. And we have been able to convene such a wonderful, diverse, quality group of administrators, teachers, students, professionals around a very timely, relevant, and important subject. We are sharing stories, expertise, research, ideas, and proposals with the view of learning, encouraging one another, and finding ways forward and creating new realities for, in this case, international students here online. Even in this space, we feel some sense of exchange and connection and even community. I do long for the day when we can go back to meeting each other in person and in-person learning and training because I believe we as humans need this physical shared space. That being said, when we do, I look forward to continuing developing these shared spaces online as well. We are learning that it offers access to information that can be useful. It offers more people, the more people the opportunity for cross-cultural and intercultural exchange and learning and community building. We are finding that it is indeed possible to share personally and deeply, to build friendships, to build learning communities and coll collegial relationships. A methodological key to online learning is guided and facilitated spaces 
for real-time interaction, such as this one, to supplement the written forums and pre-prepared pre lessons. So this is the work of globeethics.net. And we want to use our platform to serve the community and work with you and work together. And so I'd like to give you an overview of some of the opportunities and resources that globeethics.net has that you can use immediately. And also some indication of potential we have that we can tap into together in partnership. This is a depiction of what Dr. Ike was talking about. So this is a summary of globe ethics, understanding of ethics and what we're promoting. Globeethics.net has a commitment, which is to provide as much opportunity and access to all as much as possible. One of the ways we do it is that we have an online digital library, which is free of charge and open access uh, and downloadable to anybody, anytime. Uh, when you register with us, there are a few items which are open to you only at that point, but most of the items in the library are just open by going there through the link that you see here. We have a library department which carefully curates collections that may be of interest in our network. And for you students and researchers and teachers, it may be of interest for you to know that it includes several really worthy journals. And it also includes collections on cutting edge ethical themes. Users are invited to upload your own work into the library as well. The only requirement being that it has the open access permissions needed. So no copyright conflicts there. So even the library is something that we want to build up together with you. We want to become aware of resources that you know of and we don't that would be of benefit to others. We also have a publications department. It is a part of our work in initiating research on cutting edge topics around ethics, as well as gathering researchers for projects. You are also invited to publish with us and to approach us. And our commitment is to keep costs low and find a way forward with people who are interested. And all of the books that we publish get uploaded into our library. Here are a few examples of books we have published, which are then available to all of you. Again, they're free to access and even to download. And they're also available to order uh, in, in hard copy. And just a few more examples. The growing edge of our work is in developing online and blended courses and trainings. We are launching a two semester cycle of courses. The next one uh, beginning in the new year. And the courses are currently in ethics in higher education corporate social responsibility and sustainable development, as you see here, and also responsible leadership and intercultural and interfaith communication. All of these courses are developed in partnership with experts in the field and sometimes with institutions. We are um, open to partnerships 
with institutions in contextualizing our courses and even in co-developing courses for the future. Individuals can sign up for these courses and we also work with institutions to bring in groups of students, possibly negotiated toward degree requirements at your school. So you can join the network as an individual by simply registering with your email free of charge. You will receive our newsletter with all our updates uh, by doing so, and then we'll be part of our network. We also have a consortium of individuals and institutions gathered as a kind of professional network around ethics in higher education which I can share more about you know, with you individually if you're interested. In fact, we have representatives and partners and network members all around the world. We wish to be a place of gathering for joint research, learning and action. Please do not hesitate to contact us if you'd like to explore entry points for you or your com community beyond a simple registration, which we hope you'll do. We hope you'll register today. Um, this is just an illustration of the many different institutions we partner with, um, the, the priority um, partners uh, in terms of implementation are higher education institutions. So just to wrap up, um, as quoted by Sam, Samraj Tarun Jaya Selvan, if I said his name correctly, yesterday, still I am learning. And, and then, as affirmed by our final presenter yesterday, when he talked about this concept of Ubuntu, um, I'm learning and we're learning um, and we have ever more the need to uh, learn together and Globe Ethics uh, seeks to be a, a platform and a partner in this effort, in this joint effort and in this uh, commitment that we all have um, today in today's world. And so I conclude by uh, welcoming you to contact me for further discussion and to register in our network uh, again, thank you very much for the invitation to be with you today. And I look forward to hearing from our presenters as we continue through the webinar. Thank you very much, dear Ms. Fausel, for the wonderful speech with brilliant information and also for giving the orientation. Now it's time for questions. I request our participants to please get their doubts clarified using the chat box. Dear Dr. Christine, there's a question from uh, Mr. Samson Ali. How can we initiate global student mobility in courage in the coronavirus endemic in the world? Yeah, it's a very, um, it's a very relevant question, isn't it? Because there have been some definitions of student mobility as actually crossing a border. And today, we, not all of us can cross every border. Um, so I would say two things. One is that I think all of the institutions are, are, are struggling with this question and trying to find ways to still welcome um, international students. And in some cases that is online right now. Um, and we all look forward to the day when there is more support and more access for actual travel and crossing boundaries. Um, and, and then I take us back to what um, Dr. Stuckelberger was talking about yesterday, which is um, in making explicit efforts to be the mobile in our, um, in our interaction, in our engagement with resources, with scholars, with scholarship from other places, with students from other places, 
by joining into networks like this or by taking you know, courses through platforms like globeethics.net, which brings together international you know, students from all around the world to, to have a joint learning experience. So I think it's both, you know, for, for those people who can find a way, you know, into a different institution, go for it. And let's, let's all think together about how we can reshape and, and give more support to that process. And at the same time, there's a lot we can do in the meantime. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kristin. Uh, there is a question to Dr. E.K. Father, can we get across to you? I think perhaps he had to leave us for another meeting. Okay, 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 okay. So maybe, uh, can I put across a question to you then, ma'am? Sure. Okay, so uh, there, it is uh, a question asking on uh, your take on the issue, international students returning home as armed revolutionaries. It's out of focus from you, I think. But I didn't catch the last phrase. Returning home. As armed revolutionaries. As armed revolutionaries. I guess it depends on what we're armed with. You know, I, I hope we're armed with knowledge and and passion and commitment for our communities. And I do believe that um, that revolutionary change is needed in our world. And um, we're trying to come together to think about the ethical values that we want guiding us as we go about, you know, being transformational and responsible leaders, you know, into the future. So it's a big topic. Um, come in, come and take our class on responsible leadership, you know, come and, and or join another class somewhere else, somewhere else or other forums where we can get into the, the meat of questions like that. But it's a very good question. And, you know, it's a very, it's very important to um, come back and share what you've learned, you know, and bring your new visions into, into your different communities. Once again, our hearty gratitude to Ms. Christine Housel for her talk, clarifications, and time. Now over to Dr. Dinagarlal. Now it is time for us to move on to the paper presentation. The paper presentation session will be moderated by Dr. Sidney Shirley, Dr. Susan Roy, and Ms. Jessney Evangeline. Good evening, friends. I'm Susan Roy here. With me are Dr. Sidney Shirley and Ms. Jessney Evangeline to anchor the paper presentation section. Let me introduce the first paper presenter, Dr. Andrea Mariel Actis, Assistant Professor at the University of Buenos Aires, Faculty of Medicine, Argentina. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for this wonderful meeting. I, uh, I feel honored to be part of this uh, webinar with all of you, and also blessed to meet uh, such uh, wonderful people. Um, next slide, please. I would like to introduce the University of Buenos Aires. Um, this university is a public and free university founded in 1921, uh, 1821, sorry, with unrestricted entry, currently considered the best Latin American university by the consulting firm QS. And um, we have uh, around 30,000 teachers in all the university and around 3,000, 3, sorry, 300,000 students. Uh, four from uh, five uh, Nobel Prizes, uh, 
were related to the UBA, to the uh, University of Buenos Aires. And from this amount of students, this um, 300,000 students, around 5% are foreigners. This means around 10,000 to 15,000 students. Um, due to these characteristics, um, University of Buenos Aires is one of the main destinations in the region. Next slide. Next, please. Yes, um, I would like to introduce the motto um, of the, the UBA. It's Argentum Virtus Robur et Studium. It means that Argentine virtue is strength and study. And as a heraldic gel, it uses the one decided by Ernesto de la Cargova in 1921, a shield known as major seals in every paper, in that a half naked woman appears in a contemplative attitude holding a piece. Please, this is the motto. And um, next. Yes, uh, why a woman and why, no, sorry, the, the, the before, yes. Uh, why woman and why naked? Uh, a woman because it is related with the possibility of giving birth, it means with creativity, with the creation of something new and naked because nothing is more important than knowledge that it is in, in the book, in her legs and in contemplative way, because of reflection. So this would be the three main points of university, creating uh, knowledge and reflection. The next one, please. The university has 13 academic units. Now we go quickly one by one, next. Agronomy, next. So you can also see my country and my city, architecture, the next one, please. Dentistry, next. Economics, next. Engineering, next. Exact and natural sciences, next. As you can see, it's eclectic buildings. Law is a wonderful building law, next. Medicine, this is my place, next. And they are in the middle of the city. Pharmacy and biochemistry, next one. Philosophy, next. Psychology, next. Social sciences, next. Veterinary, the last one, okay. Please, next one. Um, now, Argentina is part of Mercosur. Mercosur is an open and dynamic process with the main aim of promoting a common space for integration opportunities. It was created in 1991. And the main uh, aspect is that most of the countries, this is the 12 countries which uh, actually are uh, participating of Mercosur, but most of them are Spanish speaking and also Catholic religion. The next one, please. So in this context, the main advantage is the language and also the, um, the religion. Consequently, students' mobility constitutes on one hand a phenomenon of interest for governments, institutions, and specialists. And on the other hand, it represents an integration challenge for the massive flow of international students with this similar cultural heritage. Next. Um, of course, we have some negative topics we should take care. One is the brain drain. I think this is all over the world. The other one is the lack of integration of students due to discrimination or marginalization. This may be also because of prejudices who was we have been talking about before, and the competition of the competition yet for shops between foreigners and natives in the host country, especially when the country 
is in a poverty situation. The next. So um, it should be considered as a place for integration because although it is true that the host countries of university students focus on maintaining or increasing the flow of foreigner students in the context of increasingly intense competition and that the countries of origin of the students seek to retain or recover the university students who left the country, a great advantage is that culture exchange and interpersonal ties favor the emergence, the emergence, the emergence of a generation of young people with a sense of unity and identification with the region, especially because of the per interpersonal ties, uh, friendship, and also some marriages that could happen in the university campus because they know each other, the young people, and they want to um, uh, engage between them. Next, please. So Buenos Aires is a big city, uh, an intercultural city. We are um, very open mind here and it's a tempting destination for youth due to the great offer of entertainment and the advantage of the currency exchange. Actually, we have uh, um, devaluated money, so we are very cheap for the foreigners. Unfortunately, of course, we are still under the COVID lockdown, so uh, we are starting now and we expect more people coming for the next year. Next one, please. About institutional responsibilities, it's a, a few, two, two slides more now. As part of the institutional responsibility of the universities, it would be desirable to review and strengthen the values, principles, and objectives that underlie internationalization, such as intercultural learning, interinstitutional cooperation, mutual benefit, solidarity, mutual respect, and equality of associations. A quality education will be enhanced when the students achieve personal development and social insertion that allows the promotion of sustainable growth for the entire community. The next one, just think in the future, the possibility of accessing to an international university quality education becomes one of the most important ways for undergraduate and graduated students to actively participate in the cultural, social, and economic integration of the region. The distance learning and the new educational technology also may improve the regional integration. And for the last topic, I would like to say that education should prepare us for the unknown. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. That was a beautiful presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Andrea Maria Lightus. Let us now listen to the second presentation by Mr. Mihai Yorel Hurt. PhD Research Scholar, the University of Bucharest, Romania. Hello. First of all, I would like to thank you, the organizers, for uh, this opportunity to be part of this great event. Uh, I'd like to speak uh, about one, to tackle one part of the culture more, so about the religion part. Religion plays an important role nowadays and uh, one of the interesting features is the process of seeing uh, the conflict into a religious note. This is the case uh, of conflicts that break out without religion being a, a reason. Uh, globalization and regionalization meet the most stubborn challenges precisely in these areas of um, intolerance, tribalism, and underdevelopment. Favorable conditions for uh, the production of destabilizations, international security crises, armed conflicts, and others include ethnic religious elements as well. So the religious factor manipulated by political leaders can amplify the devastating nature of ethnic conflicts. In today's world, nothing seems to concern society and the individual more than the exposure of various affiliations and identities, but at the same time, paradoxical. Unfortunately, 
it has become a fashion to show off one's ethnic, social, sexual identity, but there is little, if any, talk about the religious one, which gives the person the essence through the connection he establishes with the transcendent. In the society, there is a strong tendency of people to join a social group. Here, we will speak about tolerance, which must be valued in two respects. On one hand, as an attitude of recognizes the value of personal choice in relation to what is enranged as religious and moral truth. And on the other hand, as a restraint from the negative appreciation of the beliefs of others and their acceptance as being theoretically justified. An exacerbated way of highlighting the negative aspects of tolerance is found in the writing of a father, but the paradox of tolerance is consisted in the fact that for the sake of avoiding conflicts and massacres, we must compromise and collaborate. Beyond these negative uh, aspects, tolerance also shows its positive aspects, even by the simple fact that it reveals the acceptance of something that is seen as being of another nature, as something that is allowed or admitted in the name of coexistence. Levon Salah brings into discussion opinions which affirm that state intervention in the case of threatened communities can be interpreted as unfair because if certain institutional forms are no longer supported by their own members, intervention to keep them artificially alive seems unjustified. Regarding the development of special policies on minority rights, I will use the phrase special rights, uh, which is used by Will Kimilka. His analysis highlights three types of argument that can be invoked in favor of group rights, which he has in relation to ethnic groups, but which can also be invoked in relation to religious or other groups, arguments based on equality, on history, and on the value of cultural and religious diversity. Not only the uh, diminution of the difference, but also the accentuation of the difference can be a source of the generation of conflicting attitudes. The phenomenon was well highlighted by Paul Ricoeur through the fragility of identity they ma that makes us feel the encounter with the other as a threat. The different ways of living, understanding the world and life seem to determine identity attitudes of rejection and even exclusion under the sign of danger and the threat of personal and community identity. A very interesting perspective for an adequate treatment of the problems of religious minorities is opened by the policies of recognition by Charles Taylor in relation to ethnic groups. The author considers that with the contemporary discourse of recognition and identity, dialogue and recognition from others become indispensable. He points out that in this process, one usually operates on the assumption that there is a close connection between recognition and identity. Taylor reveals two major changes that have been made that have made concerns about identity and recognition grow in importance with my modernity. One is the collapse of honor-based social hierarchies, and the second major change is brought about the new way of understanding individual identity. A person is often defined by his ability to transcend his natural and social determinations. These determinations are the elements that define us in our social, biological, and mental particularity. Culture provides answers to all the actions of each individual and on the problems of life, provides means of interactions with the environment, brings peace to the individual, and guides him through a set of religious and folk traditions. I'll furthermore I'll bring into discussion a very interesting uh, thing. To learn to recognize the diversity of different cultural codes, to know how to communicate in an intercultural context, to become aware of one's own cultural identity, to be able to go beyond stereotypes and prejudices, to know better the institutions, social characteristics, living forms in various European countries, 
This could be the objectives of a broader intercultural practice in education. Religious, uh, ed uh, religious education is made through instruction, through the theoretical acquisition of, of different phenomenology of the truth of faith contained in great writings or canons, but also indirectly by educating character and will by forming religious personalities. As conclusions, I would like to point out that intolerance is one of the worst vices which has put its stigma on the entire history of human civilization. Education in the sense of being tolerant must be considered an imperative priority, which is why systematic and rational methods of teaching tolerance that address cultural, social, economic, political, and religious sources of intolerance must be promoted. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Mihai. That was a nice pres presentation. Over to Dr. Sidney Shell. That was a nice presentation. Thank you. Let's listen to the third paper by Mr. Richard Cordwell Eshon from the Ghana Education Service, Ghana. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm highly privileged to be included in the Global Ethics uh, Agenda to give a peace development to uh, the world that we live. Okay, I picked the general topic, international students' mobility and its ethical implication to brief up its basic aspect. Next slide, please. Yes, to introduce the international students study at a lot of colleges and universities across the globe. They contribute to the diversity and internalization of their classrooms campuses and communities. This means the enhanced mutual understanding of different perspectives in the classroom, so I appreciate the differences found around the world. It is therefore critical to embrace these students on campuses because their contributions have positive influence on the student population on so many different levels. These students contribute an increasingly relevant and important source of diversity on university campuses. They enrich culture, diversity, and campuses of campuses, sorry, with their original home culture and ethnic experiences. Next slide, please. So in discussions, International student mobility and its ethical implication draws the attention needed to examine the benefits and challenges international students face through cultural differences in campus experiences, new methodology and curriculum they meet. Its ethical implication on international higher education in this post COVID era how admissions of these students could be facilitated to promote global peace, understanding, and development. Next slide, please. Yes, in as much as they are, there are benefits. Contact with these students help domestic students learn about other cultures, which is important in an increasingly global world. Countries can boost their economy through the exchange they get from these visiting students. International students perform a substantial amount of research which aid 
and expand in expanding the opportunities for institutions to do research and study abroad. Next slide, please. Yes, there are benefits, but there are challenges too. So basically, the presence of these international students put pressure on the host institutions to provide services such as creation of language centers, counseling units, immigration issues, and the rest. Language barrier really can make communication on campus difficult. That has been the major problem when they want to first associate themselves with a new culture. Then within their host institutions, I mean their host home country, number of students decreases. So at times it becomes a challenge. Next slide, please. What are the ethical implications? This topic and its subtopic reflects on hardships students go through to study outside their country from. They need to go through adaptation process to overcome certain barriers in order to fit fully the new culture they find themselves studying. These challenges international students encounter before they are able to complete their courses are what the topic is about. It's also go ahead to extend, expect the measures needed to put in place to reduce some of these challenges. It has again stated that host institution of the international students have been trying harder to establish conducive learning atmosphere and easily adaptable culture for their applied international students. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I realized that cross-cultural education, which aims at broadening global knowledge and equip cultures to be aware of their relativities, has to be strengthened. International students should be given the time and opportunity to acquaint themselves with the introduced culture before they begin their academic work. The challenge of this acquisition, which has been battling most students, should be critically considered to relieve international students of visa stresses and other traveling documents. Method of teaching the students must also be looked at when curricula seem different but geared towards the same career, it becomes difficult to study it. In this current situation where COVID is devastating the world, proper measures to help students who are studying internationally to go through their courses without difficulties. Thank you very much, I'm done. Thank you very much. And that was a very thought provoking presentation. I now hand over the session to Ms. Jessmy Evangeline. Thank you, Dr. Shirley. Let us now listen to the fourth paper presentation by Ms. Dawn Si Fong Han, President of this Institute for Viet US and Globalization Studies, California, United States of America. Over to you, madam. Ma'am, please unmute your mic. Hello. My uh, presentation is about international student mobility and its implications on ethics for promoting global peace and understanding. Uh, this paper 
focuses on four competitive logic of international mobility. Um, as we know, internationalization is not a new concept. It has begun since the ancient time until the late 19th century and attained its peak in the 21st century. The first logic is pilgrimage, when Hajj, an annual Islamic religious, visits to the holy city of Mecca and Zayara to shrines are seen by most people, devout or not, as distinct social practices. Every year, millions of Muslim pilgrims and visitors hit the road as a mass movement to be focusing like a thriving scholarly field ever since the early 20th century. The Hajj is a mandatory religious duty for Muslims that must be carried out at least once in their lifetime by all adult Muslims who are physically and financially capable of undertaking the journey and can support their family during their absence. Also, this is a demonstration of the solidarity of the Muslim people and their submission to Allah, their God, and the rituals of pilgrimage are performed over five to six days each year. Besides the Hajj and Zayara in the Muslim world, uh, there are other pilgrimages such as Buddhist pilgrimage to uh, Asia, East Asia, to East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, and Christian pilgrimage to the Holy Land, to the places associated with the law of passion, death, and resurrection. Uh, recently, research indicates that there are more than 400 million people who annually embark on traditional pilgrimages in Saudi Arabia, India, Japan, and elsewhere, with the numbers steadily increasing. And the second, the second logic is what might be called soft power internationalization, that is the ability to influence without using the threat of military force. The term applies to the influence of nations in the international arena. There are eight common examples of soft power, such as economics, when trade and economic structure are developed as markets. Uh, education when the elite of other nations attend your school and leadership when the credibility of your leadership must illustrate the perspective of, of other countries. Then it is the use of a country's cultural and economic influence to persuade the other countries to do something rather than the use of military power. And over the past 30 years, the Europe's Erasmus, Erasmus program is designed specifically to help generate a pan-European identity for nearly 4 million students to study in another European country. Then here, then the third logic is, yeah, next, next please. The third logic is more competitive and is what was called war for talent. The main goal of this international student mobility is to act as a talent magnet, where scholars from around the world flock to American University for doctorate studies and researches. And these universities were globally preeminent and attract more young foreign graduate students many of whom stayed in the United States and how the country expands its scientific lead over other countries. And many other countries in Europe and England have copied uh, these formula to encourage their country's university to look abroad as a mean of control and economic exchanges. Next, please. The fourth dominant logic is what was called the pecuniary interest internationalization which means that under the right circumstances, international students can generate a great deal of revenue, such as even rising for student costs and stagnant, or declining for student expenditure in higher education, the money they bring in is used as fee for maintaining budgets and prestige. These competitive logics are not mutually exclusive. They have different policy goals and justifications in different cases of support. And I want to 
elaborate more in the soft power interna internationalization. Um, I just mentioned that there are eight common examples of soft power, such as economics, when trade and economic structures are developed as markets. In education, when the elite of other nations attend your school. Leadership, when the credibility of your leadership must illustrate the perspective of other countries. In diplomacy, when skilled the diplomats and their relationships are well respected. Institutions, when influence over institutions orchestrate international cooperation. Culture, when cultural influence is in great need. And foreign assistance, when helping developing countries is in demand to build out infrastructure and institutions. Reputation, when the reputation of a nation is very important in the eyes of the world. That is the second logic uh, of interna internationalization. And we know that in the current global interconnectivity, soft power is used to facilitate, to facilitate positive collaboration to deploy effectively the uncertainty and geopolitical instability. It is a diplomatic tool that is well recognized to achieve influence by building networks, communication, compelling narratives, by establishing, by establishing international rules and drawing on the resources that make a country naturally attractive to the world. Then, with the third logic of international student mobility is more competitive and is what was called a war for talent when its main goal is to act as a magnet. Um, these, and we know that uh, the, the, these universities will globally preeminent and attract more young foreign graduate students. This is a great formula that has encouraged other countries such as Europe and England to look abroad as a mean of cultural and economic exchange. The soft power and war for talent logics have one thing in common, that is they are both not for profit programs. Most countries on, or universities pay good money to attract students. This contrary um, to the fourth and currently dominant logic is what was called pecuniary interest internationalization. This logic started in the United Kingdom in the 1980s under the Thatcher government when it permitted cash to strap the university, universities to begin charging international students for their services. This model took a big step forward about 20 years ago in Australia. And gradually, it took all over in countries as New Zealand, Canada, and Malaysia as well. These uh, competitive logics are not mutually exclu exclusive. And allied with world system theory, the higher a country's position in the world system, the more central it is in the international student exchange network. For instance, since the mid 19th century, Chinese intellectuals turned to the West for truth. China's modern education system has since been built upon a Western experience with little space for China's vast indigenous intellectual tradition. The shift of knowledge system from traditional learning to Western intellectual formation symbolizes the establishment of modern disciplines in Chinese universities. In our modern world, in, with the internet, everything is connected to everything. People are now interdependent and interlocked to each other as nations and individuals. Therefore, global conflict and global peace and understanding play hand in hand as two sides of a coin and ethical implications become a tool for understanding conflict resolution. It impacts people's lives to the point that global interconnectivity becomes a fact of life, which means that we all share a common destiny, destiny 
danger and hope as well. When in danger, everybody is deeply interconnected and affected, such as the pandemic of COVID-19 that happened in Wuhan, China in 2019, has already illustrated this in this picture as the whole world has been affected and impacted and millions of lives were taken away. There was no exception. When in hope, people are locked together in a way that has never been the same like before. Again, they have to share the same fate with each other. It, is, it will be a failure and disaster when one side does not understand that they share a collective destiny with the other side. In this case, collective security is not enough. However, today, when and where everything is connected with everything via high technology of the internet, the most important thing about what people can do is that they must do with each other, not in isolation. In conclusion, as of today, international student mobility plays an important role in international relations, politics, economic, and peace building in this arena of global interconnectivity. The four logics of internationalization are the foundation for international student mobility and its implications, and explains how ethics for promoting global peace and understanding come into the picture. I would like to add uh, more um, um, about the pilgrimage. The pilgrimage to me that is uh, important. We know that uh, Recently, research uh, indicates that there are more than 400 million people who annually embark on traditional pil pilgrimage in Saudi Arabia, India, Japan, and elsewhere. With the numbers steadily increasing, I repeated that because as of today, it is a global phenomenon. Pilgrimage helps bring about interaction between and among diverse people from countless cultures occupations and walk of life. At the fifth global conference of year 2018, many personal, interpersonal, intercultural and international dimensions of these often profound events have illustrated how pilgrimage has a great impact on global interconnectivity. And in recent years, pilgrimages have experienced extensive growth as tourism and migration. And in the soft power, the same thing. And we think that international student mobility is very important in the recently, but around the world. And it is uh, what we are learning a lot. Thank you. That was an insightful presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. John Fee Fung Han. Let us now listen to the last paper of the day. I now invite Dr. Peter Igelawa, lecturer at the Edo University, Yampo, Nigeria, for his presentation. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, I First of all, a quick comment. I would like to, next slide, please. I would like to quickly thank my um, lecturer, Dr. Obio Raike, who has just left. Um, from the context of the studies, I'm looking at the international media study students of Germany and how they interacted in their program. But just to give us a little background to the studies, in 2016, Germany began uh, became the fourth country globally hosting the largest international students after the US, the United Kingdom, and Australia. And it was, became the first non-English speaking country in that category. It actually overtook France. 
So in 2017, Germany hosted uh, over about 360,000 international students. But this was again in 2003, Germany had begun what the policy they referred to as internationalization strategy, which was a policy to boost the international students in a country by 30% by 2020, actually this year. But they already beat that uh, margin three years ago in 2017. So international students in Germany, they encounter a lot of problems and language problem because it, they, have job, they speak the Deutsch language, they experience culture shock, they experience the adaptation of value changes, ethical problems, amongst others. Next slide, please. So as we can see here, we can see in 2013 and 2018, we can see uh, the countries that were sending students, the 10 top most countries sending students to Germany. And we can see here from China down to France, where the students that had the most, the Indian was the second place. And uh, here the least we have Africa just been one at the bottom here. Next slide, please. So again, what I explained in the previous introduction, we can see how the population of students, uh, international students in general, which is this, the green line up here. Then we see Bindux Auslander and Bindux Inlander. Bindux Auslander are those who have come to Germany just for the purpose of studying and they are not there to stay. Then the Bindux Inlander, which is the line on the bottom, are those who lived in Germany from childhood and eventually attended secondary school and university. So we can see that uh, the Bindux and those who have come from abroad in the middle line here have grown exponentially, but in general, all international students have grown between 1992 and 2018. We can see in 1992, they were barely 100,000. And in just in um, 16 years, they had over close to 400,000. Next slide, please. So I tried to look at some research questions. And uh, the first one was, uh, what language international students speak while they study? the international media studies. I'm going to do a brief introduction on that, the IMS, what it means, and then the extent to which they communicate with foreign audience. Then I'll look at the challenges international media students encounter during their study, the kind of ethical issues the students encounter, and finally, what degree, the degree to which these students believe they can contribute to global peace. The next slide, please. So, uh, the next slide, please. So what I was trying to do here is uh, I'm looking at uh, the international students, master students of Deutsche Welle. These students, uh, this program started in 2009 in Germany. And in 2014, they had a fifth set of students. Students come of, from all over the world to study in Germany, to do that program is a master's program. And in 2014, there were 27 international students from five continents and 23 countries who were studying in that two years program in Deutsche Welle, born in Germany. Bonn is the former capital of Germany. And these students finished their two years program and completed it in 2016. So I, I prepared a souvenir and I sent it to all the students, but I got 17 uh, responses back, which is about uh, 90%. I used Google Form to send the questionnaire to all the students and got 70 responses, which is 90% of uh, the sample size we required. Next slide, please. And this is the total number of students and the continents that studied in that program from 2004 to 2016. We can see Africa here, there are about uh, five countries. We see Asia. We see Europe, we see South America, and we see United States of America. So these were the total number of students. You cannot see the bottom here now, but there are 27 students. And then this is sample size. Those who responded were these, the 17 of them, as you can see. So in this research, I combined South America and North America. Since North America is just the United States of America, I combined both the two into one. Next slide, please. So the findings of this research show that before the students came into Germany, 
I'm sorry that this slide is, uh, maybe we're not seeing the bottom here. Uh, before the students came into Germany, uh, what we can observe is that this is Europe here. I'm sorry that you can't see the bottom here. This is Europe and Europeans were able to interact more in, with an international audience before they came for their international studies because they are students from Spain, they are students from Macedonia. Uh, and then this is, um, this is America, but the next slide, please. In this slide, after the two years program, we discovered that Americas, the Americans became more flexible to interact with an international audience. And also here, yeah, Africa, we can see that Africa moved up a little bit and Asia uh, went down in terms of the interaction with foreigners in the two years program. The next slide, please. And then when I looked at the ethical issues here, uh, we discovered that in the course of their two years program, the uh, Europeans had issues with uh, giving tips. You know, tips is when you, somebody does something and then you want to give the person some kind of money to compensate for or to thank the person. And we saw that Africans, this blue is Africa, here this is Europe. We discovered that these two continents had issues with giving tips. But in my research, I discovered that Europeans believe that people should not be forced, that students should not be forced to give tips when they come into a foreign country. Whereas for Africans, they believe that you have to give tips in order to encourage people who are not performing well. So it's a kind of complicated way of looking at their results. Uh, Africans believe that you, you give tips to those who didn't perform well so that they can improve. But Europeans believe that you give tips when somebody has done a good service, but without compulsion. And we can see that here, Asians had the least issues, ethical issues in their studies in that two years program. They didn't have many issues like the six of them we have seen, we have seen here, how to keep deadlines and all of them, and even how to obey instructions, how to learn how to respect all jobs without discrimination. Asians had the least ethical problems with these uh, problems. Next slide, please. And when we try to look at if this master's program, because they are students from all over the world, how it can help to promote peace, uh, the research showed that Americans, or the, those from the American continent, believe that the program harmonizes and helps the students to promote more global peace. Uh, Africans and Europeans have the least optimism that the program could contribute to global peace in their interactions. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we can see that international media students, they speak mainly English and German, and some of them speak French. Internationally, international setting, Americans and Africans' competence to deal with an international audience overtook that of European students, indicating that American and African students were the fastest to adjust. African and Asian students had the most challenges in trying to understand politeness, patience, and tolerance with regards to dealing with others. And ethically, European and African students were uncomfortable with giving tips to people who were simply doing their jobs. While Africans wanted to go to those with poor services, Europeans emphasized that tips must be voluntary. And also, difficulty in accommodating and accepting other students' view in group tax was the biggest crisis cause, a crisis causing situation for the international uh, master students. And finally, American students are the most optimistic that international studies like it, IMS could promote global peace. Next slide, please. So my recommendation in, in this research is that African and Asian students should learn more about the culture of the host country when they travel abroad for studies, especially on the issues of politeness, patience, and tolerance. International students should understand the ethical issues surrounding giving tips when they travel abroad. International students should see IMS studies as an opportunity to promote global peace because you have students from all over the world. European students should not give away their international outlook when they travel out to their native countries because we can see from the research, they were more open to international audience, but when they came for the program, the output dropped. And lastly, international students should learn how to deal with students from dif different cultural uh, setting, especially if 
those students uh, are from different uh, background. So thank you very much for listening. That was a brilliant and fact-filled presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter Egelewa. No Let us now move on to the final speaker of the two days international webinar. I now hand over the session to Dr. Ivan Swinjan. Over to you, madam. We have Dr. R.W. Alexander J. Sudasan, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Hindustan Institute of Technology and Science, deemed to be University, Chennai, for delivering the valedictory address. It's an honor to introduce Dr. R.W. Alexander J. Sudasan, a dynamic leader, world-class educationist, professional researcher, and an able administrator with more than 34 years of academic experience and who is currently the Pro Vice Chancellor of Hindustan Institute of Technology and Science, deemed to be University, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, India. He was formerly the principal and secretary of Madras Christian College, Tambaram East, Chennai. Dr. J. Sudarsan's area of expertise fans across entomology, pesticide, applied zoology, higher education enhancement, and so on. Dr. J. Sudarsan is an internationally renowned entomologist and administrator and has undertaken academic visits to several foreign countries. It is important to note that innumerable news about his achievements and overseas experiences have been widely published by many and highly regarded television channels and broadcasting agencies. With these words, I request Dr. Alexander J. Sudarsan to give the valedictory address. Over you, sir. Many thanks to Dr. Evangeline Jenny for your very warm words of introduction. And before I begin, let me know my time frame. I it's going to be in India. It's going to be um, it's going to be four o'clock. Can I go up to four twenty? Am I given twenty minutes? Can anyone respond? Uh, yes. yes, sir. You can proceed till four twenty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, most respected organizers of uh, this international webinar. There are many, many people due to paucity of time. I'm not here to, I'm, I would just be very brief. Uh, the one who delivered the inaugural address, uh, Professor Dr. Clint, uh, Professor Dr. Christoph, Reverend Dr. Josh Nandikara, Reverend Monsignor, Madam Christine Ozel. And uh, here I find uh, Professor Dinagaralal, my long-standing friend, and also uh, Mrs. Rajula, whom I know for several years from the time I was associated with the SCM. Uh, many international uh, delegates uh, who are here uh, before me on the screen, and many participants. And it's a delight to be associated again uh, in this area of global ethics after a period of time. Uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, Madam Rajula uh, for connecting me with global ethics and also the opportunity to deliver the valedictory address in this very important uh, uh, conference, which is of great relevance. I had the privilege of logging in about half hour, half hour ago, and I had uh, uh, the talks very beautifully delivered, very crystal clear by all the uh, paper presenters, and my congratulations to them. And I'm sure that in the past two days, you would have had uh, enriching presentations from different participants on this important topic on international student mobility and its implication on ethics. Well, friends, we are now in the uh, pandemic time. I exactly remember how the situation was uh, in November 2019, moving on to December, because I very certain things happened in my life and I can very vividly remember. I had a small difficulty, um, a kind of a pain in my body. I think it is pertaining to my limb because I, I, I do play badminton every day. And the uh, attendant in the hospital conveyed to me that uh, it's somewhere in November itself, there are groups of people who are sucked in because of the pandemic uh, in uh, China. Please pray for them. I never took it seriously. But then months moved on, months rolled over, and then we could see the pinch of it as we moved on to February, March, and we know what is the situation. 
situation now. The point that I'm trying to drive upon is that uh, the world has experienced pandemics in the past. There has been instances of uh, smallpox, cholera, uh, measles, and many other pandemics the world over. And uh, people were stuck. Probably it, were not, it was not for this long time, but it was for short duration. However, life was paralyzed in all of these instances. Communication uh, was completely cut off and uh, people could not move about uh, some of these things we do experience now. But the single difference that has uh, been very handy and very welcoming to the educational community and to trade uh, on the whole is the communication system that we have. The digital communication that we have at the moment has enabled the educational activity to go, go on. Even in schools, uh, the kindergarten and up to the research, levels, uh, cutting through undergraduate and postgraduate education, we have never had any difficulty with regard to the teaching learning process. Of course, there are limitations with regard to the virtual mode of teaching, but nothing could have happened if this digital technology has not been there with us. So thanks to the revolutionary strides that have been made uh, in the field of uh, science and technology, and today we are able to communicate freely, we are able to do something on education, and uh, people have completed uh, uh, probably one semester uh, in some of these places, conduct of examinations and things like that. Therefore, thanks to the technology. Friends, talking about, uh, it has got also relevance to the present topic, the international student mobility. That is why I want to connect the present situation uh, to the, uh, the, the core of the topic that we have been uh, discussing for the past two days. As, it, uh, as I speak to you, I uh, speak with a lot of experience. As it was outlined earlier, I had served in an institution where internationalization was uh, probably very good there because it was one of the pioneering institutions in the country which had international students, international faculty. And as I spent most of my time in that institution, I have an experience. And even in the present institution, I do have an experience because there are foreign faculty, there are foreign students in Hindustan University where I'm, where I'm serving at the moment. Thirdly, I myself have traveled uh, quite a bit, quite uh, a lot. Um, both as a student, as a scholar, as a, as, a, as a scientist, as an administrator to different different countries, have interacted with a number of international students. And therefore I do understand you know, what the topic is because I myself have reacted to different situations um, which were challenging to me uh, at different points in time as a scholar of uh, residence uh, in, in Switzerland when I was a part of the uh, Ecumenical Institute over there. The fourth important point is that I myself have witnessed experiences shared by my own son when he was doing his international education in United Kingdom, where he was exposed to different types of people speaking, speaking uh, English in different dialects. And each of those uh, uh, probably communities or youth, they felt that that their dialect is supreme. And they would purposely speak like that to, to, to keep up their supremacy over the students from their own land and particularly the international students. So I combine uh, in my presentation, you know, all of these as I, as I run through uh, what I wanted to say uh, uh, in my valedictory address. In fact, there was a very interesting uh, presentations uh, by uh, Dr. Richard, um, uh, Madam Duong, and even the last presenter, you know, he made very beautiful reference to uh, the tips per se. Uh, I was very carefully listening to it. And I'm sure that many of you would have traveled to the United States. And if you had had uh, something, you know, that you got served in a, in a restaurant, it is rather, a, not a, a standing rule, but it is a must that 2% of the bill has to be given as tips. And you know, particularly with international students where the money may not be there uh, to give 2% uh, of the total bill as tips. But uh, I had opportunities to host uh, a couple of uh, uh, dinners for my friends. Uh, very joyfully, I, I did um, uh, give uh, the tips because you know uh, I had such opportunities 
probably after becoming an administrator, not as a student. So I was uh, I was uh, having money with me to give uh, this two percent as tips in these places. And what was recommended is that I think one should in insist on giving tips from an international student, particularly from those who come from the developing uh, countries. Um, friends, as we uh, um, gobble upon this topic of on internationalization and uh, global ethics, we need to understand that internationalization of education that we are talking about is not of new origin. Probably it would have become very, very common these days because of affordability, scholarships, fellowships available, and uh, um, the global uh, world is now considered as a global village where travel has become you know, very easy and also the affordability levels have increased. But you need to understand the concept of internationalization has been there in education right from the time when the first university was born. And most of you may know that it has its origin in India, Takshashila and Nalanda, five, uh, fifth century Christian era. And the record says that in Nalanda uh, University at that time itself, there were students who came to study specific subjects of specialization from Korea, from Japan, from China, from Indonesia, from Turkey, from Persia. So don't think that uh, cutting across countries for education, which is very rampant today, is of new origin. It has been there from the time uh, uh, education began and this concept of internationalization or having international students in a particular area or in a particular university has been there right from the earliest of the universities. Now, as we know that this concept uh, of internationalization moved into several sectors of trade, of uh, job opportunities, and things like that. And people started moving very, very uh, frequently uh, across uh, the continents and across the, the countries. And an estimate uh, as, uh, uh, as says that in 2019, nearly about 7.5 lakh Indians have gone uh, to other countries, spending about nearly 7 billion US dollars. I mean, this is an account only of one year, the number of students who have moved out of India for international education. Now, I also understand, as I have served in other institutions uh, where internationalization was quite common, there had been bulk fellowships which were given to many of the Christian institutions then to enable, particularly the faculty members, to have an international experience through a research program through a PhD program or any specific program. And I know there were 25 fellowships given to different institutions. I remember it was given to the American College, to the Women's Christian College, to the Madras Christian College, and it moved to different places, thus enabling the teachers to go to a, a different land, particularly as Bonn was um, mentioned, Germany. They were the EZD provided opportunities for a bulk of these people to go to Germany to have this experience of studying and learning there and bringing back uh, the, the best practices from those institutions these, to these places. And little before that, there were fellowships like uh, Danforth Fellowship. And even now we have the Fulbright Fellowships where People from the developing nations were given opportunities to go abroad to have an international experience. Not just a study alone as people go to overseas. It is a kind of a wholesome learning experience in terms of several facets so that some of the best practices, as I said already, would be brought to the institution where they serve for the enhancement of quality for the enhancement of standards in uh, the respective institution, in the area of uh, their specialization, and also in probably improving the amenities and facilities. That is what I think is very important. Many of uh, our friends uh, from the political circle and other places go abroad, but the moment they come back, they forget where they have gone. But I have always been very, very particular that whenever I went abroad, I learned uh, important uh, practices and I brought them back, which, which is of relevance, which is of importance, which is unbiased, which would help my institution. And I brought them back and I implemented. And therefore, you are creating, you know, uh, uh, an upheaval in your own um, 
uh, place uh, a transformation, a transition for the for the betterment. And uh, therefore, uh, this kind of benefit uh, comes to the institution from where people go for higher education. But then what happens is that you need to uh, have a very, very important uh, element of what we call adjustability. Adjustability is something very important because the place where you go, the way in which people would speak English, you may not be able to follow. And probably the people in the Western countries would think that people who come from the third world countries do not know how to speak in English. I still remember, you know, my interaction with uh, a priest in a Catholic church somewhere in Slav in London. I went a little early to, uh, for the service and there was no one there in the, in the, in the, in the, in the church. And this gentleman, uh, after having interacted with me a couple of uh, for a couple of minutes, asked me, how is that? An Indian, you are able to speak in English. By that time, I was an assistant professor in the, in the college where I served. And I said, very sarcastically, if I do not know English, if I don't speak the way that I speak, I don't win my bread and butter. It was, it, was, it was taken aback. People still, you know, even uh, when I was once in another country in France, when I was having an in, uh, uh, informal conversation, the same kind of a question was posed to me. And people still think that, you know, the English uh, knowledge is uh, rather, you know, very, very, it is an infant stage. But then the point is that you need to impress upon them that, uh, that because of education that was brought by the Westerners to our country, we are, we are able to speak we are able to converse, we are able to learn, we are able to deliver lectures uh, in a language, you know, uh, and the way in which it is, it is spoken, it is comparable to the people of the Western world. Having said that, uh, there are also certain challenges which I have faced, which I, I will be interesting to share. Sharing is another important entity, which um, has been a great value in tropical countries, particularly the Orient countries like India sharing of our resources, sharing of what we have. When during uh, my sojourn in uh, Switzerland for a graduate school program, no, I was the only Indian who was there in the midst of, uh, of about 48 students who came from different parts of the world. Some of them came from the US, some of them came from Africa, and we, some of them came from other countries. But what happened is that there was at one time uh, uh, an African American who got a chocolate or got a chocolate bar and he simply bought and then simply put it into his mouth. Not mindful of who was there uh, next to those people. And of course, we were all there. But what happened when all of us had an opportunity to go to Teze, which is in France, I had an opportunity to get a chocolate bar. The moment I got it, what I did, I broke it and I gave it to my friends. And what was there, little bit, I, I ate. And everyone was shocked. Never, they never thought that this would happen. They thought that I would be uh, gulping the chocolate like the other friend uh, when it happened, uh, you know, uh, a few days ago. But then I told them, I mean, this is what is Indian culture. This is what is Indian practice. This is what is Indian value, where we first share uh, whatever we have with our friends and we probably take, you know, what is there. And if you're not going to die, if you're not going to be having the chocolate, you're not going to be die, uh, dying if you're not going to be having a meal at a particular point of time. And this uh, was well appreciated, well received. And eventually, you know, uh, in 1996, after we all parted, there were friends from Swiss, Sweden who wrote back to me saying, Alex, I remember that value. I remember that lesson that you taught practically of sharing your resources. And therefore, my dear friends, it's not only that we learn, we pick up great things from friends from the Western world. We have also got to contribute so much based on our values, based on our traditions, based on you know, what we are in our respective institutions or in our respective countries. Now, as I said, this uh, aspect of uh, 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 learning and sharing is both ways. When we go to another country, you know, we learn so many things. We make them learn, as I said, on certain values. And also when they come back, when they come to our country, they learn so many things besides what they learn in education. They, because of their stay at uh, even uh, homes of friends, they are provided an opportunity to have a wholesome learning experience, not with just academics alone, but how uh, the situation in a home prevails. 
and about the other logistics that prevails in a home, we are able to learn uh, all those things. So it is for this wholesome experience, I think that, uh, that uh, I think we are uh, able to provide if the uh, internationalization uh, is not just restricted to being in a hostel or in a hotel, but then being with the home, it provides an opportunity for people to have a total experience. Now, as I was telling you, um, in the case of international uh, uh, students' experience, when students, particularly from the developing world, go to the places, they are put under a lot of uh, pressure, particularly, as I said, language barrier, the diction, um, and all those things happen. And uh, I mean, this is what uh, happened to my own son, you know, when he was studying in Liverpool. You now, you got a particular kind of uh, a set of youth who are called as cows. I think you know that the way in which they'll be speaking English, you cannot really decipher anything. And uh, in fact, my son did uh, really have some experience, but after being there for some time, he got adjusted to the situation and he also started speaking like a scout. And also application of mind is very important when you are there in overseas country. When he was studying uh, in that uh, university, I had an opportunity to visit the Liverpool Hope University. And when we were traveling, you know, he was uh, booking for a taxi. And when he was booking for a taxi, you know, he said, uh, I'm so-and-so booking a taxi. And you know what? Uh, he uttered a different name than his own name. He said, I'm John calling. So, and immediately the person came. Then I asked him, my son, hey, your name is not John, but then why did you say so? He said, my name, they cannot understand at all. They cannot follow it at all because mine is an Indian name. And therefore I've used this name as John, and uh, I am able to transact business. So the point is that you need to be having that acumen, the sharpness in mind to adjust, uh, because you know you will be able to get get many many things happen. The a few other points which I would I would like to touch upon, particularly on this pandemic, is that as it was already pointed out, international students, or if you are going to be hosting international students in your institution. It's not that they only come, but they also come with a lot of money because of the differential currency value. You know pretty well, um, a US dollar would fetch about 70 uh, Indian rupees. And as they come to India, they also bring in you know, uh, revenue because they'll be uh, uh, paying in dollars for all of those courses and they stay and so on. And because of the pandemic situation, the international students are unable to come to our institutions here. And as a result, there is a block in the fund to flow to an institution. And therefore, I think we need to promote uh, some of uh, these exercises. And we, we hope and pray that this kind of a movement will take place uh, before long. The next important area is uh, at this point in time is what we called as internationalization at home. Now, because of the uh, situation, pandemic situation, we are today, though without the travel, we are able to meet each other. We are able to bring in the expertise available in USA. In, um, uh, in different parts of Turkey, in different parts of the world to our local environment. I think that is a great experience. And that is what we call it as internationalization at home. Education is possible by that. Webinar is possible by that. Assessment is possible like, like that. And therefore we need to have uh, this approach, but definitely this is not a substitute for physical presence. For, uh, and therefore, I think we all have been contemplating that uh, blended education, having both offline and online education is what uh, is uh, required. My last point is that as people go from uh, developing countries to the developed countries, I think we need to be providing them total scholarships. I think the waiver of the fees and even international travel, I think need to be uh, taken care of so that you know you are able to uh, have the benefit of the experience of people coming from certain countries, uh, which otherwise they won't be able to make it. And at last, I think um, internationalization calls for global peace. And uh, I think together, because we all live in one common world and peace is a subject which is common to all of us. And we need to be united together we need to be working together. We need to have this flow of people from across the countries and across institutions so that we all are called to remember that we all belong to one global family which God has instituted. Thank you once again, Professor Dinakalal, Madam Rajula, and all the organizers for having given me this opportunity. I'm sure that we'll be able to meet sometime physically, either in my institution, in the Sun University, or we'll be able to meet each other and share our experiences in whichever part of the world which God has destined for us. Thank you and God bless.
Thank you very much, dear sir. We are grateful to you, sir, for being a friend of Globetics and patronizing its activities. Today, you have proved that you are going to be an asset to Globetics India, and I'm sure you will extend support to our programs in future also. Your participation was indeed a great source of inspiration and encouragement to the organizers. Your sparkling talk is indeed accepted as the grand finale of this international webinar. Thank you very much, sir. Now over to Dr. Dinagarlal. A very special word of thanks to Dr. Alexander Jesus. My dear friend, I'm very happy to meet you through this webinar. Well, that wraps up our two-day international webinar. And on behalf of the Department of English and Center for Research, Scott Christian College, Globetics Net India, and Journal of Dharma, I would like to thank you all for making time in your busy schedules to join us here yesterday and today. My special gratitude to all the speakers of day one and day two for their multi-dimensional points of view and observations. I gratefully remember all the participants from different parts of the world. I'm happy to state that we had an overwhelming response from 45 countries. My gratitude is due to Globetics Net Head Office Geneva, which helped us to discuss in depth the different aspects of ethics using webinar and for monitoring and providing technical assistance to this webinar. My gratitude embraces all who strove day and night to make this program a success. A very special word of thanks goes to the energetic, ever active, sincere, and shall I say, ever young Rajula for taking up a lot of responsibilities and guiding the organizers. Now, may I request Rajula to take over the floor. Unmute, please. Rajula, unmute. Thank you, Dr. Dinakar Lal, for your encouraging words. Probably your word is making uh, us to work on a new foundation for a new webinar again. And uh, from my heart, I express uh, my gratitude to uh, yesterday's speakers, Dr. Clint, Father Jos Nandikara, Dr. Tristef, and uh, today's speakers, Dr. Obiore Ike, the Executive Director of Global Ethics Net uh, Geneva, Ms. Christine, and our valedictory speaker, Dr. Audrey w. Alexander Jesudasen, for really contributing to the richness of this program. It has become possible uh, with all your uh, heartfelt contribution. Thanks a lot. And at this time, let me express my hearty thanks to all those responsible for making this event a grand success. I should mention especially Dr. Sydney Shirley, Ms. Jesney Evangelin, Dr. Evangelin Jimmy, Dr. J. Dinakarlal, Dr. Susan Roy, and Dr. J. G. Zuresh, the HOD of English Department, Scott Christian College. My special thanks to the Correspondent Secretary, Mr. Baiju Nisad Paul, the uh, Principal of Scott Christian College, Dr. J. R. B. Edward, and without the unstinted cooperation extended by the team of the Geneva Office of Global Ethics Net, such a grand webinar would not have been possible. I'm grateful to them for the administrative and technical support, as well as their encouragement and sharing expertise through guidance. Now, before we close, a reminder and request to all the participants and the paper presenters, please fill up the feedback form and you will receive your e-certificates. The feedback form link will be sent to the registered email ID, the ID used for logging into this webinar, and you will receive the e-certificate within a week's time. Please note that the feedback form will be active only for 12 hours. We wish you all a pleasant 
day thank you we will meet again thank you